Alright, um, so today we'll talk about uh, propagators, specifically propagators for free scalar fields. Uh, this is the first uh, step towards uh, understanding Feynman diagrams, um, which are the basis of uh, calculations in quantum field theory. Um, so propagators, let's say, uh, can be thought of as solutions uh, of the klein born equation with the delta function, so the equivalent of the Poisson equation, or Green's functions, Green's functions for the line gordon equation, line gordon is the function. Um, and uh, the name tells you that they will describe propagation from one point to another, and uh, correspondingly, when we construct Feynman diagrams, uh, we will have interactions and propagations. Propagations will be described by propagators. Um, but before we turn to them, we need two more pieces of information. We need uh, a relativistically invariant covariant quantization is the formalism of quantum field theory must be relativistically invariant or covariant. Relativistically invariant um, canonical quantization or version of canonical quantization. Remember that canonical quantization is canonical, that is to say is with respect to the Hamiltonian formalism, which specifies the time. So we need to be sure that whatever we do looks relativistically invariant. And also we need to describe a complex scalar field this is something that I alluded to last time I said we were looking at the real scalar field for simplicity but the real scalar field does not contain all the uh, physics that uh, we will use later on in particular does not contain antiparticles or better yet, better said um, the the particle associated with the scalar field is its own antiparticle. So in order to see antiparticles, um, we'll have to consider the complex scalar field as well. <coughs> so last time we did, we did some uh, things in a non-relativistic um, notation. In particular, we described that for the free scalar field, we can think of it as a, a collection of harmonic oscillators, and correspondingly, the Fox space is the product of the uh, Hilbert spaces of these oscillators. Um, so for each one, so for each mode, we have this uh, standard. Um, standard occupation number state where these were the normalization was chosen in order to be orthonormal and then uh, 
the discretization involved in putting the system in a box corresponded to uh, relating relating AK, the uh, oscillator, with curve B, alpha K, the oscillator in the discrete state. And then delta function, which for continuous momenta was just the Dirac delta function, then uh, became Kronecker delta with a volume in front. However, as I said, we want a relativistic formulation. And this one, uh, you know, seems to be, at least it's, it's described non-relativistically. We, we have a volume, but spatial volume it means you define a special time. Um, so, the relativistic normalization that we would use is for states not to be um, invariant with uh, delta function and this delta also is all delta 3 on the space but rather with a factor of 2 EP and we'll see why this is a relativistic normalization So, but that means that uh, the states in here are missing. So now we have we have the delta n n, that is to say uh, v k k, right? But that means that we still uh, we still need first of all we need a factor of the volume in order to obtain the correct normalization since we will have for the two states we'll have square root b from one square root b from the other and then we need also this 2 ep so or, or 2 omega k distributed among the two so a square root 2 omega for each of the two states that are made product so i need a square root omega in the state and the square root v in order to obtain the correct normalization that I want. So that means that the normalized states so let's say I need V times 2 omega K in this I need an extra So that means that the relativistically normalized states
are the ones where I introduce this 2 square root 2 omega k and square root 2 v, uh, sorry, square root v, and also to pi cubed. Yeah, I, I should have put also to pi cubed, I guess. Um, times uh, the product of creation operators. <coughs> Okay. So this would correspond then to so if I go back to the continuum notation with a k one was curved and k and then uh, this thing was denoted by AK. Um, well, I guess I'm confused. Well, not two pi, not with two pi cubed, right? It was just this one. So this would be AK square root of omega K two pi cubed. AK zero. Professor, were you missing the two pi? Uh, to the power of three there, because the last class you put, put I put it here. Yeah. Okay. That's why perhaps. Yeah. All right. Good. Don't have to that it. sounds better because that was a little bit annoying to have two pi there. Okay. Um, so now let's see why this is relativistically invariant. So I, I've shown what we need to have, but I just claim that this is relativistically invariant. I didn't show it. Now let's see it. <coughs> so first of all, this thing is obviously invariant under rotations, spatial rotations, right? This is has the correct structure. So if we want to consider full Lorentz invariance, we can think of it as rotation invariance plus boost invariance. But really the only thing that we need to show is that this is invariant on the boosts. <coughs> so it's invariant on the rotations. And then on the boosts, boost that is to say, if I uh, boost along the third direction, I write a boost like this, gamma is square root 1 minus v squared and v is beta is v so v over c but v in this case and uh, then I also remind you that so uh, we will replace this so we'll get a factor of gamma but then I remind you that if we have um, a delta function of some function well minus the value of the function at some point x0. This is delta x minus x0 over absolute value of prime x0. Right? So, um, uh, so we will uh, consider the transformation of the delta function uh, written over there. And uh, we want to see that the transformation generates the same factor of 2e that we had. Um, sorry, a little bit. I have a monitoring device that I need to wait for a little bit to finish its job. So, delta of p minus q 
is written now if I, um, well, um, so if I have, uh, if I have, if I multiply this with d p3, right, this should be invariant because uh, this would give 1 in the corresponding uh, directions. So this would be the same as d p3 prime delta of p3 prime minus p3 prime, right? And then I can divide with this. And this ratio is equal to uh, gamma Um, times 1 plus beta d e3 d p3 and um, e3 is of course square root e3 squared plus n squared so d e3 d p3 is what? it's uh, 1 over the square root, which is e3, and then p3, right? So this is p3 over e3. <coughs> so this is uh, delta 3 p3 prime minus q3, uh, sorry, t3 minus q3. Oh, sorry, p prime minus q prime times gamma 1 plus beta p3 over e3 um, and perhaps I can take the e3 outside and write it like this and then I note that this thing is nothing but e prime Um, and correspondingly, I obtain now that E times delta 3 P minus Q is equal to E prime delta 3 P prime minus Q prime. Okay? So, the quantity that I have in here, E times delta 3, of p minus q is actually relativistically invariant. It's not explicitly so, but it is relativistically invariant. All right. So the normalization that I introduced corresponding to these new states is relativistically invariant. But uh, it still remains to, to see whether the expansion of the field in the canonical normalization, whether that is also written uh, in a relativistically invariant way. So, the expansion was written naively in a form that is not, at least not manifestly, invariant. It was written with d3t and then 1 over square root 2e downstairs and then a p p to die px plus a die p e minus i px where p0 was ep. Right? Um, so, I want to consider states of this type, right? States where I act with 
a p square root 2 e p. Now, if I use these things, right? Well, with some numbers in front, but if I have this for page number one, there's no number in front, right? So if I use this thing, then I've shown before that I have a relativistic invariant normalization, right? So I write this then square root 2 e p, square root 2 e p. And then everything I have on this side is relativistically invariant. This is relativistically invariant, and this is relativistically invariant. Okay? So everything here is relativistically invariant. That means that I have to show that this thing now is relativistically invariant. Right? So the question is, is integral b3p to pi cubed 1 by 2 p relativistically invariant? And, well, let's try to write it in a form that is manifestly so. So, to, to do so, I have to write, uh, to write it in terms of this element, right? But that's easy. I just have to remember to put a delta function in here, right? And then, Moreover, 1 over 2 EP looks like 1 over F prime of X0, absolute value. So in fact, if I write this as 2 pi delta of P squared plus N squared, again where P0 is EP, right? If I write this, and P0 is positive, um, Uh, then, this is what? This is minus EP squared plus, um, sorry, minus, no, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't even need this, uh, P0 positive. Then this is minus P0 squared plus P squared plus N squared, but this is EP squared. Right? And then this is delta of minus P0 minus EP, P0 plus EP. Right? But you see the minus is irrelevant because in the formula for delta, uh, for delta of x, delta of f of x, um, I have an absolute value in the denominator. So the minus is irrelevant. And then this would be f prime and at x0, that, that is at p0 equal to ep, this becomes 2 ep. Right? So indeed I have um, this value is equal to 1 over 2 ep delta of uh, yeah, delta of p0 minus ep. Right? So then substituting in here, I get the value from before. Yeah, I guess I should have... Yeah, I don't know how to put this, but you see in here we have P0 equal to EG. So, um, so the fact that after taking the delta function, P0 is fixed to EP is exactly as, uh, as needed. Okay? So, uh, so finally, I write this 5x and t as 5x only, uh, implicitly saying that the resulting uh, field is relativistically invariant, relativistically covariant, but since it's a real scale, they're also invariant. Um, so I can write this in this way, and 
then square root 2 EP, AP, e to the IPX, plus square root 2 EP, AP dagger, E minus IPX. Okay, so that was the um, relativistic uh, invariance of the canonical quantization that we did last time. Now let's extend that to a complex scalar field. So let's say canonical quantization of a complex scalar field. observation is that there is a global U1 symmetry where phi goes to e to the i alpha phi and corresponding to phi star e minus i alpha phi. Right? So since this is global, alpha is a parameter that is uh, independent of space-time. That means the derivative cannot act on it. So that means this term goes to d mu phi with e to the i alpha. And this term goes to d mu phi star with e to the minus i alpha. So this term is invariant. And this term is invariant by itself also. I have e to the i alpha phi from the first and e to the minus i alpha phi star from the other one. And correspondingly, I get phi and phi star. Right? And finally, the potential itself is a function of phi star phi also. 
but that was already in there. So this whole Lagrangian is invariant, and we note it's the whole, it's actually the Lagrangian is invariant, not just the action. Okay? Uh, and in fact, so I guess I'll say about this more, but in fact, this U1 can be thought of as uh, electric charge. Even though, even if it's not some realistic model, um, the the um, charge associated with this U1 can be thought of as electric charge. So vi visualizing it like this, it's easier to understand the physics. And then. And then uh, we can follow completely the discussion from last time, um, but it's not worth uh, doing it. Really, we can write down what we will uh, obtain for the canonical quantization. Same factor. Just the only difference is that now remember the field is complex. So for the real scalar, this term is the complex conjugate of this term, as it should be. But now they don't need to be uh, related. The field is complex. So I can write independent um, independent variables. So this is still some A dagger, but of some other uh, field. So I'll write A dagger minus. So this is a dagger, whereas this is plus and minus. P and T to the minus I P X. Okay. Uh, yeah, and then in this case, phi dagger is a plus dagger p and t minus i p x plus a minus p and t into plus i p x. And the same thing for the momentum we wrote last time. Uh, sorry. <coughs> this is minus i squared coming out here over 2. Uh, and then we have a. minus e to the i p x. So before we had the same a plus was equal to a minus. But now uh, now they are not uh, related. So Remember that now, here we have d mu phi, d mu phi star. So this term starts with phi dot, phi star dot, right? Which means that phi phi is d d phi dot, which is phi star dot. Phi phi conjugate to phi is phi star dot. 
So this is, I mean, pi means pi phi. So this is phi star or dagger dot, right? Um, so uh, so this will will have a plus with a dagger and a minus without a dagger, right? So this would be equal to phi dagger dot. And then the complex conjugate, phi star, or in other words, phi of phi star, will be equal to phi dot. So this is d to p over 2 pi cubed, minus size square root omega p over 2, and then minus dagger pt, p minus ipx, plus Oh, sorry, minus a plus pt e minus ipx. Okay. <clears throat> okay, and um, the observation is as before. So this was. Uh, the way we derived, we derived first the kinematics, right? Which was uh, based on the ansatz of the harmonic oscillator, but without any equation. And then um, the dynamics came from Clyde Gordon, and we obtained that omega p is just the energy. So omega p is dp, which is for p squared plus m squared. This was from Klein Gordon. So, so this. What I've written here was already ba true based on just the harmonic oscillator on that. But the klein gordon equation now is the same, right? It's still, uh, uh, still d squared minus m squared on phi is 0. So that means that omega p is still equal to ed. All right? Um, and uh, the ansatz itself was constructed, well, first of all, we have to have the canonical com communication relations, so phi of x and t with phi um, of x prime and t. The commutator needed to be i h bar delta x minus x prime. So that was, in some sense, we impose that. That is the canonical quantization at equal time that must be true for any variables. The commutator of a variable and its canonically conjugate momentum should be equal to uh, i delta. But from it, with this ansatz, the point of all this ansatz is that we find that A with A dagger um, well, of P and T of P prime and T is P pi cubed delta P minus P prime. Right? That was the point of like this. Just that now we have independent A plus and A minus. So you can say that we find, in fact, for both of them, uh, the same relation. Okay? You can check that yourself. Uh, I think I left it as an exercise. But, I mean, it's really easy just following what we did last lecture. And also the time dependence is also the same, again. Pretty obvious. Uh, another thing that I left as an exercise, but it's uh, once again pretty obvious that we should get the same result. 
is that the U1 charge operator so the another charge associated associated with it is U1 right <clears throat> when written in terms of uh, operators becomes integral or sum over momentum, right? And it's obvious what it should be, right? It, so the charge is a sum of momenta and of what? Well, of occupation numbers, how many particles you have in each uh, oscillator, right? Just that there's one catch. I wrote A plus and A minus. That's not random. The point is A plus has charge plus and A minus has charge minus. So when you do the calculation, you'll find um, that you get A dagger A for the modes with plus with plus, but for the modes with minus with minus. So this is n plus k, and this is n minus k, the occupation number of modes plus uh, with momentum k, and the occupation number of modes minus with momentum k. So that means that q is well, it's integral or sum n plus k minus n minus k. Okay. <clears throat> so what do we see? How do we interpret then phi and phi star? Well, phi has a minus dagger, so that means that phi. creates uh, charge minus and is A plus, so annihilates charge plus. And the opposite is true for phi dagger, creates charge uh, plus and annihilates charge minus. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, what is the meaning of this? Well, in this simple model, where I, where I have a single scalar field, we can see what's happening. So, the charge of one type of particle is plus, the charge of the other type of particle is minus, but everything else is the same. Right, they're both scalar, they belong to the same field. So this is exactly what we call particle and antiparticle. Right? Um, particles that have the same properties, in this case the same, same properties because they belong to the same field. Um, and the only difference between them is the charge. Right? So plus and minus correspond to particle antiparticle because they have the same properties except opposite charge. Okay. So the only the only non-trivial thing um, in this new model is that now we have independent particles and antiparticles, but otherwise the model is the same as the real scalar field. We can say we reobtain the real scalar field if we just choose A plus equal to A minus. That is, if we say that the particle is equal to its own antiparticle. If we do that, the scalar field uh, from last time is the same as this one. Okay?
All right. All right, so let's now go uh, to the meat of the problem. So, as I announced, the point about today's lecture is to construct propagators. And we'll see that they are related to two-point functions. functions and propagators. So <clears throat> uh, If I would consider this complex scalar field, what I should consider is a real uh, observable, which would be uh, a two-point function. Now, I know that I define the two-point function with the time-ordered product, and we'll get to that, but for the moment, we will consider without the time-ordering product. So, a, a real two-point function would be like this, phi star x, phi y, uh, in between vacuum states. So, this would, and then here, x would mean tx and x vector, and this would mean ty and y vector. So, this would correspond to propagation from, uh, from x at tx, so, sorry, from y at ty, to x at tx. This is quote-unquote, because really what we have is a measurement of phi at, at this and of phi dagger at this, right? So, really, this two-point function uh, defines the correlation in between phi dagger at x and phi at y, or the uh, measurement of phi at y and phi dagger at x in the vacuum state, right? And this is similar to the propagation from q prime t prime to q t. But not quite, right? I mean, one important difference that has to do with the difference between quantum mechanics and field theory, and we'll discuss that later in great detail, is the fact that here the states themselves define um, defined, uh, x and t. Whereas here we have to consider the fields. However, I defined the two-point function Before I defined it like this, right? So really, uh, morally, what happens is that these states in field theory replace, I and mean, the external states are replaced by the vacuum, right? And then these things are replaced by the fields. However, there is a place for external states corresponding to particles as well, but 
uh, that is a different um, quantity called uh, S matrix, and we'll get to that uh, towards the well towards the end of the uh, the course. Um, but the point is, um, correlation functions, these objects are more fundamental. However, physical scattering are related to this S matrix where we have some particle states uh, and not just vacuum states. So, one has to keep that in mind. But at the level of analogy, I'm saying this object is analogous with this in that both of them correspond to a propagation from some position and time to, some, to another position and time. Okay? Um, I consider, for example, the real and the binary part and the degree of freedom. Did this interpretation change? No, so in fact, I, I just considered, I, I just wrote this to to emphasize that to consider a real function, but uh, from this moment on, I'll restrict to just a scalar field, uh, just a real scalar field. So, so for simplicity, I'll consider a real scalar, and nothing changes. The complex field was used only for interpretation. This fact that we have particles and antiparticles, and their charges are different, but uh, otherwise is not needed in what we'll, we'll uh, do. All right, so let's calculate this. Let's just substitute this expansion and just calculate, it, right? Uh, so calculate it, and. Uh, Remember that A and A dagger are operators that act on, uh, on states. And in particular, I have that A acting on vacuum is 0. And also, the dagger of this is true. So 0 A dagger is also 0. Right? Uh, so in the case of a real scalar field with phi or phi dagger, what do we get? Uh, maybe let's leave this for a moment. So for a real scalar, that is this phi over phi dagger. This thing becomes what? So, in other words, here a plus equal a minus equal a. Uh, so I put this in between zero and zero twice, right? And so if I get a dagger oh, in the left, I get zero. If I get a dagger on the right, I get zero. So this is some integral, and then a plus a dagger, and here a plus a dagger. But a acting on 0 gives 0, and a dagger acting on 0 gives 0. Right? So that means the only non-zero terms are ones of the type a, a dagger. Right? These are the only uh, non-zero terms. And these come specifically, so if I write one integral over p and the other integral over q, then a p and a q. And then um, a from the first comes with e by p x. And from the second, I get a dagger with e to the minus i q y. Right? <clears throat> but
But then this is what? I remember that I have the commutation relations, so I write this as a dagger a plus the commutator with a and a dagger, right? And then a dagger um, a dagger a is also zero because I can either act with a on zero or with a dagger on the zero on the left. So this vanishes, right? And then this is a p with a dagger q, but a p with commuted with a dagger q by our definition was uh, two pi uh, two pi cubed delta of p minus q, right? Um, sorry, uh, I need now to be more precise. Um, so for A's, I've used um, right. So the normalization for the A's was uh, with two pi cubed only, right? Um, yeah. So the normalization for for A was was two pi cubed. So that means that now I have. Right, let me write things more precisely then. So two pi cubed over two. Uh, this would be over two pi cubed, one over square root two dp. Then d three cubed over two pi cubed, one over square root two e cubed. Right? And then these factors that I put in here. So the result of the commutator in between zero then is two pi cubed delta three uh, of p minus q. And uh, I wrote here a, a dagger, but I have two terms of this type, right? Uh, I have um, no, sorry, I no, I just have one term. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so I kill the integral over q, and then I put p equal to q. So yeah, I should have considered this as well. Uh, so there is, the final result is then integral d three p over 2 pi q. And this one cancels with this one. Now this gives 1 over 2 d p. And here I have e to the i p x minus y. And that's it, right? Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, I should have. Uh, I, I was a little bit too quick. I, I put this thing in here, but this also corresponded to um, and the time, time dependence was like this, right? Such that the whole thing was e to the, e to the i px in here and e to the minus i px in here, right? The relativistically invariant uh, exponential. And then it was a p so without the time dependence, right? Which gave the normalization condition that a p commuted with a q is 2 pi q delta p, p minus q, right? So, um, so in the end, in the final result, I don't get just exponent of the vector product, I get exponent of the four product, e to the ipx minus y. 
Okay. All right. So let's call this. This would be five x, five y. Now remember that this is for a real scalar field where phi dagger is equal to phi. And I call this d of x minus y. So d of x minus y, this quantity here, is integral this would be over 2 pi cubed, 1 over 2 ep, e to the i p x minus y. Well, the first observation that I want to make is that this is relativistically invariant. I mean, that's kind of obvious because the expansion I did proven that the expansion was relativistically invariant, uh, the expansion of the fields, but that means that the formula for the two-point function is also relativistically invariant. This was invariant and this is invariant. Right? Uh, but now let's see specifically what happens for timeline and space-like separation, which are the two relevant cases. <coughs> so A, let's say, time-like separation. That is x equal y, but px minus ty is t zero. <coughs> so then uh, e to the i p x minus y becomes just e to the i uh, minus i um, p p t right? uh, or more precisely square root p squared plus n squared t uh, and, and then d of x minus y is integral d 3 p over 2 pi cubed, 1 over 2 e p, so 2 square root p squared plus n squared, e to minus i t square root p squared plus n squared. <coughs> and d 3 p I can use uh, spherical uh, coordinates. So I write this as d omega d squared dp. And the integral over d omega gives me 4 pi. Okay. And then, moreover, uh, I can rewrite the integral over p integral dp into integral de. <coughs> um, so p, since p is uh, square root e squared minus m squared, I write um, and dp then is de over square root e squared minus m squared. Um, then this becomes 4 pi over 2 pi cubed integral p squared is e squared minus m squared dp is de over square root e squared minus m squared uh, then I have here 2e, and here e minus i dt. And the integral, so when I did this, the integral from p was from 0 to infinity, but now the integral for, from uh, over e is from m to infinity, right? Um, Uh, sorry, I did something wrong. Um, what did I do wrong? 
I lost some factors somewhere. Oh, here, let's see, so dp, oh yeah, of course, this is e dE over square root. And uh, e cancels. And then this gives me a square root. OK? So this is 1 over uh, 4 pi squared integral from m to infinity dE squared e squared minus m squared e minus e dt. OK? Um. <clears throat> now, when t goes to infinity, we note that there is not nothing um, good happening. So when t goes to infinity, uh, this thing goes like e minus i and t. I mean, we can put here the lower bound, which is the only thing that appears in the integral only depends on n, so it has to be going like this. And, um, uh, but it has this exponential factor, so this, this will, will, uh, will keep the exponential factor. So this is oscillatory. Now, is this OK or not? I mean, physically, what do you? What do you say? So remember, it's time-like separation. So we're fixed at some position, and time just goes by. Well, it's normal, right? I mean, if the particle sits at the point, the, the amplitude for its propagation should be oscillatory, because well, it doesn't move, right? So this is OK. There's no problem with that. Physically, it just means the particle sits still, and, uh, and so the amplitude should be oscillatory. <coughs> now let's see what happens. Sorry, I didn't understand why it's like. Well, could you repeat? You, so you have a massive particle that just sits sti still at the point. Time like separation means x equal y. You sit still, time just goes by. Well, this is the amplitude for propagation. If the particle sits, the amplitude should be oscillatory. Such that the probability is constant, right? Because <coughs> the probability is absolute value. <coughs> OK, but what happens for space-like separation? So now we take the opposite uh, view. We say that we are at a given time, Tx equals Ty, but the separation is purely spatial. So, you know, for, the point is for, for, in a relativistic theory, for time like separation and space like separation are the only two relevant cases because by choosing um, a frame, I could always put either that or that, right? Depending on whether Ds squared is positive or negative. All right, uh, so in this case, d will depend on this x minus y, and is equal to what? <coughs> so this was d to p to pi q, to e p, e to pi d x, but this is now, this time p is zero, so this is just e to the i p x minus y so r called r okay <clears throat> so I can write this as p r times the cosine of theta the angle between them right I integrate over p but r defines some direction and then the integrated p has some some angle theta with it and then 
now I cannot uh, write um, d omega. I have to write specifically d phi times uh, sine theta d theta. But d phi gives me some 2 pi. And then I write d sine theta d theta as d cos theta. And then the same uh, p squared dp. So this is now integral of uh, now 2 pi, 2 pi cubed first, then uh, d cos theta minus 1 to 1, and then integral dp, p squared over 2 dp, e to the i p r cos theta. And this one is the same as we did before, right? So uh, this integral was uh, dE squared root E squared minus M squared. Um, maybe, no, maybe I want to keep it just as, just as uh, in the integral of a P. So, um, let me write it then as square root p squared plus m squared. Okay, and let me do well. I think I mean this on the other side. <laughs> Whatever. So the integral of this is e to the uh, i p r. So integral of p. Just the integral itself is e to the i p r minus e minus i p r i p r. Right? Uh, so that means that my d of x minus y <coughs> is. Um, Uh, 1 over i is minus i, so minus i over 2 pi squared. And then, um, then I still have 1 over 2 r. And then the integral of p, dp, p squared over square root p squared plus m squared p by p r. Okay. Oh, sorry. E to i p r minus e minus i p r. But now, um, now I have an integral over p over all possible p's, and I want to put these two um, to to put e minus i p r in the form e to plus i p r. So in the second term, so here I change p to minus p, right? But p squared is invariant. Also, square root p squared plus m squared is invariant. So the only thing that changes is integral dp becomes integral minus dp. So when I do this, I get a plus both here and here. Okay. So this just gives a factor of two. Um, I think, I think I forgot the factor of 2 in my notes. Did I? Yeah. Well, OK. So this gives a factor of 2 times e to the i p r. And now I have to calculate this integral. But, uh, ah, no, sorry, I didn't. Uh, yeah, so the point is that one, one side of the um, the first term in the, in the integral, integral of a dp, is from 0 to infinity. But if I change to the integral uh, between, uh, if I change the variable from p to minus p, then the second integral is from minus, uh, from minus infinity to 0, right? So all in all, this integral, uh, well, 
we write it again. Minus i over 2 pi squared, 1 over 2 r. The integral becomes from minus infinity to plus infinity, dp, d squared, d to the i pr, over square root, d squared plus m squared. And now, um, I have a trick from complex functions. If we have an integral um, over the real line that we don't know how to calculate, but it has this exponential factor, the way to do it is, I mean, even if it doesn't, but then it's a bit more, then we have to fake it. You have to write things like e to the i times something. Um, but if the fact is already there, it's easier. We have to uh, write this as an integral of the complex plane and remember the residue theorem. So, um, <clears throat> so I have an integral now over the complex plane P, right? The integral is from minus infinity to plus infinity along the real line. Right. I'm sorry, but um, the P over then in the expression of the result of the integral doesn't will make some difficult with the sign over there because you have P squared, but it's P squared over P in there. You already assume that this is. You see what I'm saying? Because then you're going to solve. Oh, I forgot the P. The P. Um, P to B minus P. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, I, that's right. But yeah, okay. so I, I did two sign mistakes. You're right. Uh, so the first one was uh, yeah. So there was one over P. So so now I have, but now I have dP times P, which is uh, which is yeah. certainly sign invariant. Okay. But the but the integral is from zero to infinity, which okay. moves from zero to minus infinity. And in order to be done from minus infinity to zero, I have a plus. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So there were two sign mistakes. Good. So uh, uh, so So the, the, the residue here uh, says that if I, have, if I have an integral in the complex plane of a function that has only poles, right, then the integral depends on only the poles inside the contour, right? So if I close the contour at infinity, then uh, the integral over this will only depend on the contours in the corresponding plane. Now, I could I have got two choices, right? I could close the contour at infinity uh, in the upper plane or in the lower plane. Upper half plane or in the lower half plane, right? The choice is I want, I mean the point is that I want the integral over this semicircle to be zero. So that's where this factor comes in. It's chosen such that um, this thing has to be uh, zero there. And we see that indeed, if P has uh, imaginary part of P positive, right, then that means I write this as e to the i times i, which is minus imaginary part of P times r. Okay? So this goes to zero. So if the imaginary part of P is positive, like on this semicircle, then this thing goes to zero. And since it's exponential, it goes to zero fast enough so that the integral at infinity actually vanishes. Okay? So the integral of this is equal to zero. So therefore, the integral of, um, over this closed contour is equal to the integral that I want and is equal by the residue theorem with a 
poles inside, the residue at the poles inside, right? But what are the poles? Well, this thing is a pole. So poles are at p squared plus n squared equal to zero, which of course doesn't have a real solution, but we're in the complex plane. The solution is p is plus or minus i n, right? But we're not interested in the pole in the upper half plane, which is at p equal to plus i n. There's another one here, minus i n. Okay. Okay. So my integral d of x minus y is equal to uh, uh, is equal to the residue at p equal to plus i m. Right? And I only need how it behaves. Um, I don't need the exact solution, but you can do it yourself. But the point is, um, this is the function itself. So when you take out the residue, the, so take out the square root uh, p um, minus i m. Um, then uh, you obtain um, uh, you obtain some factors of i n from p plus i n and this p and so on. But those are not what interests me. What interests me is the fact that I get this relevant factor. So i times i n times r. So this goes like e to the minus n r. Okay. This is the same problem that we obtained for the propagator in quantum mechanics. That's not so surprising because a field is just a collection of particles as we just saw. So it's kind of expected that also the propagation from x to y in field theory should, uh, should be non-zero and moreover exponentially non-zero for space-like separation. And that's what we obtained. But then, how about, um, how about our uh, claim that somehow quantum field theory is better than quantum mechanics with respect to causality? Well, the point is that this is not observable. This is not observable. So, for a particle, if you just have a particle, that's the only thing that you can observe, the particle. But in a field theory, the point is that this propagator, which behaves in the same way, is not what's observable. And what's observable actually behaves uh, well. So we will see shortly why, I mean, not shortly, but a little bit later, why, but the relevant observable thing, so observable, the relevant observable thing is actually the commutator of phi of x with phi of y. Uh, and uh, well, this is a, the commutator of the operators that are made up of a and a dagger is a C number because the commutators with a and a dagger are C numbers. So actually, this in fact is the same as the expectation value between 0 and 0, because, well, if it's a C number, then 0 and 0 gives 1. So it's the same thing, right? So, so we could see uh, in this way what the result should be, right? So I, I, can do, I will do now the calculation, but you could already tell me what the result should be. So what's the result? It should be zero. Huh? It should be zero. No, no. <laughs> well, for space-like separation, sure. But uh, I mean in general. <laughs> well, we just call this, without the commutator, we call this d of x and y. Right? So this is d of x and x minus y. That's all phi x, phi y. Minus d of y and x, right? Uh, but specifically, we could uh, we could also, you know, just write this as 
integral of these, I mean, the, the whole thing. It's perhaps useful to do this. Here we have EP, AP equal to IPX plus a dagger P, P minus IPX. Commuted now with AQ e to the IPY plus a dagger Q e minus IQY. Right, so let's do this specifically and see what we get. Well, the only non-zero uh, result is from A with A dagger and A dagger with A. Right? And uh, both of these things give um, e to the um, uh, both of these things give 2 pi q delta of p minus q so a p a dagger q is this right and so the result in here will have an a p with a dagger q so that's 2 pi what I wrote in there, with e to the ipx minus iqy, 2 pi q delta 3 p minus q, e to the ipx minus iqy. And then the other term would be a dagger with a, which is minus the same thing, minus, um, the same value, but then with the opposite exponent, so e minus ipx plus iqy, right? But now, uh, uh, by the same uh, by the same thing, I can so I can do uh, uh, I can do one integral let's say integral over q, and that takes care of this factor. And then I'm left with another integral, p3p. But in that one, I take p to minus p. So by doing that, I get an extra factor of minus, and then the exponent becomes the same. right? So these two terms give the same result. Um, Some, something wrong here. Why am I doing something wrong? Uh, no, that's right. No, sorry. No, I'm, I'm, I'm being stupid. Yeah, uh, you don't get the same result in the second one. You get the same result with y and x interchanged, of course. You just go you should, yeah. yeah. So I get uh, really what, what I'm supposed to, to be getting. I get the two terms, one with x and y, and minus the other term with y interchanged with x, right? So uh, uh, all in all, I get um, 
uh, I get yeah, integral d3p over 2 pi cubed. So this one got killed with this one. And then 1 over 2 ep. Um, and then e to the i px minus y. Minus the same thing with opposite. Right? Which is the same as d of x minus y minus d of y minus x. Okay. Um, right. So now let's see what happens for this one. Okay? So the issue is for x minus y is positive, that is space like. Let's see that we have causality. So this means x minus y, zero x minus y. Um, but in this case, I can make a rotation. which just interchanges this, right? So, because this is like this, it means that x minus y itself goes to minus x minus y, right? Um, and, and then, that means that um, this whole integral, which now is just e to the i p x minus y, is uh, invariant. Is invariant, right? Which means that d y minus x in this case is equal to d x minus y, which means that the commutator phi of x the phi of y is actually equal to zero. Okay? And also the same under vacuum. So this is what we mean now by causality. That the commutator of the fields, or in other words, the, uh, the two-point function where I have the commutator instead of just the product, is zero outside the light cone. On the other hand, we should also no note that in the timeline case, it's not zero. It shouldn't be zero, right? In the timeline case, um, then uh, x minus y is tx minus ty zero. But now, the change tx minus ty going to minus tx minus ty is not uh, Lorentz, a proper Lorentz boost, proper Lorentz symmetry is neither is neither a uh, is neither a, a rotation nor uh, a boost, right? And so now d y minus x is different than d x minus y. Okay. So in this case now, phi of x does not commute with phi of y, which is the correct statement. So that means the commutation of phi of x with phi of y is what uh, constitutes um, relativistic, I mean, causality in quantum field theory. So phi of x, phi of y, Um, gives so being zero or non-zero gives causality in quantum field theory. 
for space-like separation, we should have zero. For time-like, we should have one-zero. So, Professor, our yeah. analogy between the uh, the scalar world of k uh, k prime t prime and k t would be better uh, matched with this this commutator instead of just the t that we are talking That's about. That's right. So I said that uh, because this is the, the, pro the, 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 right? the propagator itself is uh, I mean this sorry this object the uh, d of x minus y is the analogy, analogous of the propagation, right, is just that uh, it being uh, non-zero is not really what what constitutes causality. It, it, it's the analog of propagation in the sense of you know just having phi of x. Uh, I mean, of going from. Uh, from point x to point y, but indeed the thing that will be um, uh, will be uh, related more directly to propagation is not that. We'll see shortly which one it is and why. So now we come so to propagators. We can match. Oh, we can measure this d. Oh. I'm sorry. We cannot measure this d. This d. We cannot measure. This. That's why it's not a problem. That's why it's not a problem, yes. <coughs> so well, now let's see. What the propagators are and which are the physical ones. Um, well, so let's start with this last cal calculation that we did. So we saw that the commutator was the same as the web of the commutator. And uh, one way of writing it. was this, e to the x minus 1 minus e to the minus i p x minus y. But now I want to rewrite this um, in a different way that is more, uh, that is more uh, intuitive, specifically in a relativistic invariant way. So first I note that um, I can rewrite this as integral d3p 2 pi cubed e to the i p x minus y over 2 e p if p0 is equal to e p plus 1 over minus 2 e p e to the i p x minus y if p0 is equal to minus e p. Right? So why is that? Well, um, so you see that here I didn't do anything, I just put the minus downstairs. And here upstairs, uh, I took the two cases uh, separately, right? So I said, if I if I have um, if I have a space-like separation, I get zero, and if, if I have time-like separation, well, I just change the sign of, and then I have just p zero, then I just uh, put p zero equal to minus e p, and then I get the same. So then, if uh, p, if x zero is higher than y zero, 
then I can write this as what? Well, I can write this Like this. So I, I just keep the heat like px minus y, but then um, I write a complex integral over uh, the real line. <clears throat> Except, so let me let me write somewhere. So if I write the complex plane P0, <coughs> now P squared plus M squared, so this is the integral over P0, right? P squared plus M squared is minus P0 squared plus P squared plus M squared which is e p squared, right? So this is minus p0 plus e p, p0 minus e b, right? <coughs> so I have all that plus and minus e b, right? So let me say And let me choose a contour C. Oh, sorry, not I. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, plus and minus. Um, so uh, let me choose a contour that doesn't touch the poles, right? So it has the, contour, the integral is of the real line. P zero is real, right? But I do this thing. I just you can think of it as a small regularization where I just avoid the poles, right? If I do this, um, then I can uh, then I can if I choose this contour, right? Then I can close the contour from below, right? And uh, since in here I have so this is e to the minus i e zero x0 minus y0 plus i p x minus y, right? But if this is positive, right, and p0 is in the lower half plane, what I get is e to the minus i times i, it's lower half plane, so it's the, the um, um, the um, imaginary part is negative, so I can put another minus. And then x0 minus y0 is positive as well, right? So this gives a minus, and here is positive and positive. So I get an exponentially decaying um, integral in p. So that means that indeed the integral over the semicircle in the lower half plane is 0, right? at the same reasoning that we had before. So before we close the contour in the upper half plane because we have e to the plus i something, now we have e to the minus i something, so that's why we need to close the contour in the lower half plane. Right? But the result of the calculation is the same. Right? The point of the calculation is the same. Right? The 
the integral of uh, the whole contour is equal to the integral of the real line that you want to calculate, and is equal, therefore, to the residue of the two poles inside. And the residue at the two poles is given by what we had before. Let's check. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, so the first pole is at P0 equal to EP. So that's this one. And uh, so first of all, the um, uh, How do we get the signs? Yeah. So the, the, the plus sign, the plus sign is for, uh, for anti-clockwise, right? The, the plus residue is for anti-clockwise, but here the contour goes clockwise, so we get a minus sign, right? But then, uh, at plus EP, however, the, the, the residue is with minus times the value at B0 equal EP, which is 2EP, right? So I have one minus from here with a minus 2EP gives the plus 2EP that we have in here, okay? And then for the other pole, I have the minus sign from the sign of the contour, but then the pole is at B0 is minus EP, and then in, from this one we get minus 3EP times another minus, it's plus 3EP. So plus 3EP together with a minus sign from the contour gives minus 3EP. Okay? Many minuses, but you know, I should write them all down carefully first. Okay. Um, and uh, um, So, uh, so, so if x0 is uh, greater than y0, uh, we, we get this result. On the other hand, if x0 is less than y0, then what do we need to do? Well, if x0 is less than y0, this is negative, and I get e to the plus i something. So then I need to close the contour in the upper half plane, right? Close in upper half plane. But in the upper half plane there are no residues. Right? If I chose to close the contour in the upper half plane, there are no residues in here. All of them are in the lower half plane. So I get zero. Okay. So, we have seen that only if x0 is positive, we have equality of this thing with this thing. But if x0 is negative, then this second thing is 0. So, that means that we can now write a, a different equality, one that is more useful for us, and what that defines the so-called retarded propagator. Retarded being the opposite of advanced, meaning the direction of propagation uh, of, uh, of two points. So this retarded dr x minus y is by definition the uh, heavy side function that of x0 minus y times the commutator phi of x, phi of y in the vacuum. This is what we have in here. So by putting theta, we ensure that for x0 minus y0 negative, I also get 0 the same way as for this integral, which means that this is equal to the integral from before 2 pi cubed 
dp0 to pi i and p squared plus n squared divided by px. And uh, I can write this then as dr of x minus y equal b4p over 2 pi 4. 1 of i is minus i over p squared plus n squared divided by px. Okay. <clears throat> so this retarded propagator is written in an explicitly uh, Lorentz invariant way and has a very simple form, right? So we can define the uh, Fourier transform in an obvious way. And then we see that in momentum space, the retarded propagator is just minus i over p squared plus n squared. Okay. Another way of saying that is that we have um, this relation. <coughs> minus uh, p squared plus m squared dr of p is equal to minus i, which tells us that dr of p is really a Green's function for the time or an operator. is that the Fourier transform of 1 is delta and the Fourier transform of this is the klein gordon operator. In other words, of, another way of saying it directly, that d squared minus m squared dr x minus y is equal to this because indeed by taking the Fourier transform we get minus p squared plus m squared dr of p is equal to um, i, right? Okay. So dr of p is a Green's function. Good. But does it correspond to physical propagation? Well, not quite. The thing that really corresponds to physical propagation in a, in a way that we can uh, use in calculations is the so-called Feynman propagation.
Okay, this is the contour that I changed, that I defined. However, there's the reason I called it an IS long description is that I can do this directly in the uh, final formula. So the formula I had in here was related, I didn't put the C, but was implicit that I had this integral in this contour C. Right? Now I want to write a similar, a, 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 the same formula with a different C, the contour over there. But this contour can be um, defined by just modifying the numerator. So I have df of Feynman, Feynman propagated x minus y, integral d4 p to pi 4, minus i over p squared plus n squared, minus i epsilon. Okay. So that's why this is called an i-epsilon prescription. And let's see that this prescription indeed corresponds to this uh, contour. So the poles here are um, at p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon, which is p plus i m uh, uh, Sorry, Excuse me. this is minus p zero squared plus e p. This whole thing is minus p zero squared plus e p squared. So this is written as minus uh, p zero um, p zero minus e p. Um, so plus i epsilon, like this. Uh, so this is now uh, p0 minus e p uh, plus i epsilon over 2, right? Then p0 plus e p minus i epsilon over 2, right? Which means that the poles are now at p0 equal to pp minus i epsilon over 2 and minus pp plus i epsilon over 2. Right? So this amounts to shifting the pole downwards here plus pp minus i epsilon over 2 and upwards here minus e p plus i epsilon over 2, right? And shifting the poles like this is the same as saying I avoid this contour from above and this contour from below, right? So indeed, the epsilon prescription is the same as the extra contour. Um, Right, so now let's see what we get with this contour. Just one moment, please. Um. So the <coughs> the final propagator is so if x not is higher than y not we get what so 
And here I would get uh, e to the um, minus i p0 x0 minus y0. So if x0 minus y0 is positive, I have to close the contour in the lower half plane, right? This is the contour in this case, and the result is just the pole uh, at plus EP, right? Plus EP pole. Uh, and this was called. Um, Well, so this was, this was the pole at plus dp, right? And this was what we called before dx minus y, without any index, right? The retarded propagator was the other. This was just dx minus y. So the result in here is dx minus y. Now for x naught less than y naught, as, as I said before, we need to choose the uh, closing in the upper half plane, right? But uh, as we saw, the contour of integration uh, had the opposite sign, so this uh, gave minus the y minus x. So this gives the the other pole, like over there, just that now we get uh, the, the opposite sign of the contour, so we get minus d y minus x, right? So this is. This is clockwise, this is anti-clockwise. Right? Okay. So, in other words, we can write this as dF x minus y is theta x naught minus y naught times the propagator phi of x phi of y. So this was d of x minus y was this phi phi. And then minus, uh, uh, sorry, no, uh, I said something wrong. Um, Yeah, sorry. It was the opposite sign with respect to this, but here we have the commutator. So here we have minus d minus x. It's just that we have the opposite sign for the contour. Now with the uh, with anticlockwise sign, we get plus d x minus d y minus x. So we get plus theta y naught minus x naught. 0, 5 of y, 5 of x, 0. And now you notice what this is. This is nothing but the time order product. Right? If x0 is higher than y0, I put them in, the, in this order. If x0 is lower than y0, I put them in the opposite order. y first and x0. Okay? So we have defined that the Freiman propagator 
is, um, well, first of all, it, it is a Green's function. It is a Green's function for the Klein Gordon operator because it's really the same the same integral just with a different type epsilon prescription, right? So the only thing that changes in this calculation is I now have uh, minus i epsilon here. Right? But otherwise it's the same. So it's the same, uh, it's still a Green's function for the Klein Gordon operator, but has the T operator which means it's the same, same as in the quantum mechanical. Remember, we calculated this thing, the two-point function between states qt and q prime t prime, but which time are the product of qt1 and qt2. So this is the similar, um, similar kind of object. Um, and as suggested by the quantum mechanical case, this is the object that will appear in generating functions. And moreover, this will be the object that appears in final diagrams, describing in some sense propagation of particles uh, in the quantum field. That's why uh, the name Feynman. So Feynman defined this propagator as the one that appears in his Feynman diagrams, whereas people before had found uh, the other propagators. Um, all right. So this is everything I wanted to tell you today. Do you have uh, questions? All right. Yeah. I'm sorry. The interpretation is really of propagation from x to y. So, as I said in, in the final diagrams, which represent, which uh, have the physical interpretation as actual propagations and interactions of particles, we will see the final propagator, not the other ones. But the right. No, okay. First of all, you know, it's not really so. So, first of all, phi of x and y is not really what we would call propagation. What really is like propagation is in momentum space. This one, which means that. I have some particle of some momentum that keeps propagating. That is really the propagation. And that, because we will define uh, particle states as states of given momentum. And then those will, will appear in uh, S matrices that are related to physical scatterings. So th those will be external states, will be of the type of given momentum. And then everything inside will be written in terms of propagators of the Feynman type, but in momentum space. Okay. The next phase is a little bit more complicated. Interpretation is a little bit more vague. Okay. All right. Uh, so I I corrected the the ones for the exercise for lecture one. For lecture two, I'm still missing. Um, I still don't know you guys, so Felipe, is it see here? Felipe? No? Probably not. Uh, I think. And Guillermo? No. All right. Um, okay, so anyway.